the ride. That's why KTM created the radical new 1290 Super Adventure S. It goes like a rocket! The third generation of leader class adventure models comes with all the innovative features that you would expect in this class. Bumps in the track. He's just soaking it up. So smooth! Woohoo! It's ridiculous. The 2021 KTM 1290 Super Adventure S is the ultimate high-spec adventure tour with an arsenal of groundbreaking technical features. The ultimate high-performance adventure bike. These three points sum up what you need to know about the all-new KTM 1290 Super Adventure S. This motorcycle feels fast. This is a typical KTM take on adventure riding. Ready to race agility and dynamics with all new ergonomics to support this. Ready to race technology. This is the most technologically advanced adventure bike. This motorcycle comes standard with features like semi-active suspension, ACC, a variety of ride modes, motorcycle traction control, as well as cornering ABS. All the gear. This is our next generation of adventure bike. We have re-looked every single part and reworked it. Before we take a deep dive into this motorcycle, let's have a look at where we've come from. Our very first V-Twin adventure bike concept was used at the Paris Dakar, and a lot of our learnings from there filtered into this motorcycle. In 2013, we launched the KTM 1190 Adventure, known as the Game Changer. This was a big step forward for us. We were the first motorcycling manufacturer to launch cornering ABS and cornering traction control. A mere two years later, we launched the KTM 1290 Super Adventure T, and this was yet again a big step forward for us in terms of technology. This motorcycle came standard with features like semi-active suspension, cruise control, heel hold control, as well as cornering lights. Then came 2019 and we launched the Beast 3.0. This was a big step once again for us in terms of technology and a lot of our features that we introduced in the street range filter into our adventure range. With the Beast, we introduced 60 lean angle sensor and the new generation of LC8 engine, which is filtered into this machine. Our outgoing model of the KTM 1290 Super Adventure S was a fantastic motorcycle and a good base for us to start uh, development on this motorcycle. Visually, you can see many changes compared from the old model to the new model. And in total, 90% of this new motorcycle is completely new. Adrian, a lot to talk about. I think let's start off with probably one of the most important changes on this motorcycle being the frame and the swing arm. The frame in itself, uh, the frame concept, we haven't changed. What we have done is we've made the, fr the main frame shorter. So the frame is now 15 millimeters shorter and we changed the angle of the front fork. Making the frame shorter made the bike more agile, but increasing the length of the swing arm has kept the stability and the traction that we need. I mean, I'll be so bold to say that this motorcycle is perfectly balanced. The goal was for us was to get the rider closer to the center of gravity of the motorcycle. And as you said, iconic frame design, but completely new and it definitely adds to that ready to race dynamics. Another big change for us was moving from a trellis subframe to an aluminum subframe. This is obviously to save weight and it also adds to the aesthetic appeal of the motorcycle. One of the key things about the subframe is that it helped us get the seat height down. It was crucial to change the concept of the subframe so that we could give more riders access to the bike. We've seen that really for people with shorter legs, it's now so much easier to ride this 1290 than it was in the past that it's really, it changed the motorcycle around for them. We've also extended the subframe um, and this obviously gives additional space for the rider and the passenger as well as for luggage. And we've added a storage compartment under the passenger seat, which is very easy to access. Obviously that's something that's very iconic to KTM is that LED front headlight and it's still you know, stands to what it's all about. Obviously something that's very visual is we added that front radar sensor. We'll touch on the light a little bit more in detail, but are there a lot of changes on the light or did we just add the radar? It was one of those projects where uh, because we had to add the radar, we had to have a look at the, the overall design of the headlight. And in KTM, when we do something like that, we always take a good look at the functionality and we see if we can improve it. So yes, the, the headlight itself was also improved. So now we have a, a wider beam pattern so you have uh, basically more visibility in the, on the sides of the road. 
I mean, Adon, you mentioned that seat height was very important for us. We wanted to make this motorcycle accessible for a variety of side of riders, being short or tall. And there are two ways of changing seat height, as you mentioned. The first, is, and the, probably the easiest way, is to reduce the amount of foam in the seat. Uh, but that's obviously not very comfortable. The best way to do it is to change the geometry slightly and start working on subframe and frame, and this is what we did. So there's a, there's a few things we've done. Uh, one of those is that we've made the seat narrower in the front. And this, you know, when you think about it, it's very logical. Uh, if you make the seat low, but it's still very wide, you still can't stand comfortably uh, over the bike. So this helps in the overall feeling of, of handling the bike at, the, at a low speed. Another thing that's very important about a seat is that it's one of your key contact points to the vehicle. So the foam itself, if it's too soft, it, you move around too much and you can't really get feedback from the chassis. So it's quite important that the seat is firm, but not rock hard. And with this bike, we've made a big effort in improving that. I mean, we've got an interesting story. Dominic, the project leader, he rode the bike uh, obviously extensively over the, the test period and the development period. And at a very late stage of development, he took a really long trip. And it, on his return, he decided that the seat comfort uh, does not adhere to his standards and basically scratched it, dedicated uh, more resources towards uh, getting to the perfect comfort and stiffness of the seat foam. And yeah, I mean, that's one thing that's immediately noticeable. I mean, we've spent quite a lot of time on this motorcycle and it is ultra comfortable. It's immediately noticeable, but it's also noticeable after 400 kilometers. It's a really nice seat. I mean, obviously we also have two options, standard in terms of seat height. So currently it's in the, the low form. Um, so that's 849 millimeters. And then you can, by simply removing the rear seat and just adjusting it up, take it to 869 millimeters. We also have additional seats available through KTM uh, Power Parts, uh, 11 different seats, different thicknesses, different uh, widths, uh, different density, as well as uh, heated seats as well. Quite a big part of buying a motorcycle is keeping the wife happy. I mean, we all know what that, that's like. Um, if she's not happy, you're not buying the motorcycle. And I mean, Adrian, you know, we as riders spend most of the time in the front. What do we do to, to keep her happy? For the 1290, we made a very big effort to make sure that the, some of the partners of uh, people from the project team spent a lot of time on our prototypes, on competitor bikes, on our previous models, and to develop this seat. But it's not just about the seat, it's also about the position to the passenger footrests and the grips that makes the, the seating position for a passenger perfect, because this is the type of motorcycle that will be ridden a lot with passenger. Now, another big goal for us was to reduce uh, the amount of engine heat that gets obviously dispersed onto the engine and that also gets dispersed onto the rider's leg. That was a clear goal for us, you know, to get the rider to be more comfortable and as I said, get the engine to run cooler. On the previous model, we had a single radiator. We've changed it up on the, this model where we have two single radiators, each radiator dedicated to a specific cylinder. Adventure riding, uh, something that if you can, you do in, in nice weather, which effectively means that when you're riding the bike in summertime, a big 1290 engine can generate a lot of heat. So we had to work on getting rid of this heat. We've done this by using two coolers and each cooler cools one cylinder head. So the warm cooling liquid goes back into the radiator and doesn't then go to the, to the second cylinder head. It's a relatively simple concept, but you have first have to think of it. So this really me means that we can keep the heat of the engine itself low. Then because the radiators are separate, the air that passes through them can move outside through these ducts and is then moved to the outside uh, of the vehicle and never even gets blown to the rider. The third advantage is that you don't have hot air that is warmed up th from the radiator moving onto the engine. So all in all, it's quite a smart concept and it really helps get the heat down. We, uh, when you ride this bike in, in traffic, it's a very, very noticeable difference in heat coming from the engine. I mean, as we said, a big focus for us was to um, make this motorcycle more accessible for variety size riders. And that's where focused ergonomics come in. I mean, you mentioned that the headstock has moved 15 millimeters closer to the rider, which means riders with shorter arms you know, have a better reach and it's easier to uh, control the motorcycle. What about taller riders? The handlebar can still can be moved 15 millimeters forward as well. Then we've got the TFT display can be rotated, so you can, however, however tall you are, you can always make sure that you look straight onto the display. Of course, the brake and clutch lever are adjustable. As we mentioned before, the seat is adjustable. I think this is a quite a key factor. 
Another cool thing that we have is that uh, if you ride a lot in a very sporty riding position on the bike, it's quite easy to remove the passenger footrests while keeping the pannier and exhaust brackets on the bike. Something that's not adjustable but it uh, adds to the ergonomics is the width of the tank where it holds onto your leg. A lot of focus on the tank which we'll touch on now. So the fuel tank used to be of course one, one tank. Now we've moved to a concept where we have three separate fuel cells. One in the middle that then distributes the fuel to these two uh, sides similar to what we have on the rally bikes, similar to what we have on the 790 and 890s and this helps get the center of gravity down and has helped us in making this area narrower so it's easier to close with your knees. So as I said in the beginning of the presentation a lot of learnings actually comes from the Dakar uh, and eventually filters into, into our production bikes. Adran you spoke about the dash uh, really briefly we've now got a 7 inch TFT dash uh, with completely new logic, which is fantastic to, to work while you're riding. You don't have, no longer have to spend two hours in front of a manual to try to figure out where to change things. That, along with the new handlebar switches, make it super easy to use. TFT displays are super cool technology. And uh, with this bike, we made, a, we made a very big step. And of course, every manufacturer is going to say that, yes, we made a very big step. In the past, we had LCD displays, which were monochrome, and you could only work with text. Then we got these super cool TFT displays and we tried to use the possibilities of a TFT display as much as we could. But we realized that we were basically taking our old thinking onto a new type of technology. With this project, we took a white sheet of paper and sat down with the designers and thought about how can you use this very flexible, colorful technology to communicate features to the rider to adjust setting. What is the best way to very quickly while you're riding access these? And we came up with a lot of visuals. On the suspension, if you adjust the preload on the bike, you see an image of a motorcycle that moves up and down. You see a, a wheel spinning when you adjust the traction control. Your favorite is when you see the, you set the language of the bike, you see the flag of the country uh, where the language is spoken. And all these things really help to very quickly see what you're doing. Someone tell me that he said, if you switch the menu to Arabic, I would still understand it. It's, it's, that, it's that simple to understand. Obviously, there's a lot of technology on this motorcycle and everything gets accessed through the TFT dash. And the goal was to not have a menu with another menu with a sub menu and then you get into, into the function. It was to keep it nice and clear, very clean uh, and easy to use. Uh, we also have a new connectivity unit, uh, which means faster pairing with cell phones. So we have a KTM MyRide, which is basically navigation. Um, you can listen to uh, music, a playlist, you can answer incoming calls. Uh, and that new connectivity unit just means a lot faster pairing and a lot more stable. I mean, Adrian, you mentioned the uh, windshield in the front. A lot of testing went into this. You know, we obviously nowadays have 3D printers, which make it a lot easier, which you'll touch on now. But basically, we've done a lot of uh, CFD calculations uh, to ensure that we get the windshield working at its optimum. And obviously, a lot of wind tunnel testing. I'm quite a tall rider. Uh, I'm 186, and normally I have a lot of buffering uh, between myself and the motorcycle. And yeah, I'm happy to report that at various speeds, uh, different adjustments, the buffering is, is really minimal. And what we did was we added two rotary wheels, or we have two rotary wheels on either side, so you can either use left hand or right hand, and you can adjust the windshield by 55 millimeters, which obviously just help if it's raining or if you have bugs or if you may be a taller rider. What's well, a cool little detail, as you mentioned with the 3D printing, is that uh, in the past you could do calculations and then we could send the data to our supplier and then they could produce a prototype and they could send it to us, we put it on a motorcycle, test it, then engineer it again, send another uh, sample of 3D data to the supplier, get it back. But nowadays we have a 3D printer in the company, or we have various 3D printers, and the engineer can design it, we can print the, the component, put it on the bike, go outside, test it, if it's good enough, then we go in a wind tunnel to really fine tune it and then immediately change the parameters on the computer, print another one and do another test. So it really helps us to get better faster. I mean, Adrian, you spoke about uh, the tank already. So that adds to the bodywork of this motorcycle being a three cell tank. And as we said, a lot of learnings from uh, our mid-size adventure bikes and obviously um, from our Dakar uh, rally bikes as well. But something that's really cool and that's actually filtered down from uh, the Beast 3.0 from the Super Duke is that we've optimized the thickness of the plastics. Yeah, uh, it's another you know crazy science. Um, because you can, you can si uh, simulate somewhat, you can actually calculate where the plastic has to be strong 
and where it does not matter so much how strong it is. So we could actually optimize the thickness of the plastic uh, and this way reduce the weight of all the plastic parts that are on the bike. Adrian, I mentioned it in the beginning of the presentation, quite a bold statement by saying it's the most technologically advanced adventure bike. Let's talk about some of this technology and just take you through uh, some of the standard features that we have as well as some of the optional features that come with the motorcycle. Let's talk about ACC because I know that's the hot topic at the moment in the motorcycling industry. Uh, you know, everyone's talking about it. Uh, every manufacturer is jumping on the bandwagon to put it onto their motorcycles. Uh, I'm going to be very honest. Coming from a racing background, I was very skeptical. Um, you know, when you start talking about electronics to an ex-racing guy, you know, there's, there's always the assumption that there's a disconnection between the rider and the motorcycle. So I'm completely honest by saying I was skeptical. I've spent a lot of time on the bike and I've tested it in the various modes and various conditions and I can definitely see the benefit out of having this system on an adventure ride. I don't, I mean, you come from a country where you have to travel quite long distances to, to get to a nice adventure spot. Yeah, coming from Holland, uh, <laughs> we have no mountains, uh, so that's, that's already one, so to find uh, any corner is, is going to be tricky. Uh, so you spend at least 1,000 kilometers to get to the first uh, mountain, probably the reason why I moved to Austria. I'm not a racer, but I had the same reservation a little bit about cruise control. And then when you test it, you realize that this classic cruise control, you're sitting in traffic, you switch it on because it's handy. And then there's a car and then you have to slow down and then you switch your cruise control off or you, you set the speed lower and then you overtake and you have to set it faster again. And sure, it works and we've all used it. But with this ACC, you just set it to the vehicle in front of you and the moment there's a gap in traffic, you use the throttle to overtake, you come back in, the bike slows down and it's, it sets you at a safe distance to the vehicle in front of you. And it just works and it's, it's I love it. Okay, well, let's dive into it because there is quite a lot to talk about around the ACC and I find it fascinating because there's a whole bunch of numbers. Uh, Adrian always jokes, I'm the numbers guy. I love numbers because numbers tell a story. So let's start off with, with the actual radar uh, in the front of the motorcycle. So it's positioned 910 millimeters off the ground and that's the perfect place to look for cars or motorcycles. It can look ahead roughly 160 meters, which is more than enough for if you set the speed at the max of 150 kilometers an hour. Uh, it, gives us, it gives the motorcycle more than enough time to actually slow down in a safe way. So that's one, which is really cool. Uh, what is a pickup? I think that was, that was the big thing for me. Coming from the car industry, um, I was introduced to ACC pretty much at the beginning and it was quite flawed because it picked up everything and it reacted to everything. Now in our system, yes, it, it sees everything, but it only reacts to certain things. So it picks up solid objects, uh, objects with uh, good reflective properties. Uh, so cars, motorcycles, um, it does see static cars or stationary cars, and it also sees oncoming cars, but it doesn't react to it. So it can calculate that there. So the software is really clever. So, I mean, to sum it up, a big, car is easy to see. A motorcycle, obviously a little bit, I would say, not as easy to see, but it can still pick it up. What makes it, what makes it challenging for the developers is the fact that uh, a, a, car is, a car has four wheels. That already helps it. It only moves basically in two dimensions. Uh, a car has a steering wheel, so you can very easily judge where it's going. On a motorcycle, you've got lean angle, you have a motorcycle rider, you have a lot of different inputs. So there's a lot of different parameters that you have to set to make it work properly. I mean, this is where the 60 lean angle sensor comes into play as well, because it just helps us calculate a little bit more finely and more precisely. Uh, so the system works in a nutshell from uh, 30 kilometers an hour in second gear, all the way up until 150 kilometers an hour. Now, I know I'm saying second gear and 150, and those two don't work out, so you at some point need to get to fifth or sixth, uh, which means you can still use the quick shifter plus. So while you're using HCC, you can shift up, you can shift down. You can also uh, shift up and down by using the clutch. So that's also an added benefit for, for those guys that don't want to use quick shifter. It's got something called overtake assist. So if you're sitting behind a vehicle, you've got your ACC set at let's say 100, the car in front of you is doing 80, uh, your motorcycle will brake and slow down and match the speed. As soon as you put on your indicator, it will start adding a little bit of acceleration to get you past the car and get you back up to 100 kilometers an hour. So a really clever system, uh, it works really well. I mean, the overtake assist is, is mainly aimed at use on motorways. Yep. Uh, so when you're both moving in, 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 in two lanes, for example, so you can merge easily into the next lane. If you really want to overtake on, let's say, a country road, you're usually just going to use the throttle because you want to be a bit faster. 
I mean, it's also lean angle uh, sensitive, so it looks at the lean angle. So if your speed is too fast for the lean angle, it will also reduce the speed, which is I find pretty cool as well. Something else that I find interesting, uh, you know, if you're using the ACC and you're riding in the rain, if you do aquaplane and the vehicle picks up wheel spin, it will cancel the ACC as well. Something else I really liked about it is if you're using the ACC and it needs to start slowing down the motorcycle, it will first use engine brake because it doesn't upset the balance of the motorcycle so much. So imagine going through a corner and the bike starts braking, it will unsettle the bike. So by just coming off the accelerator and using engine braking, it doesn't unsettle the bike as much. And then it will start using brakes uh, to slow it down. So super cool system. I mean, Adrian, you mentioned the graphics. You can see on the display behind me, a simulation of what it looks like. Uh, very easy to use, very simple. Uh, I mean, we spoke to Bosch quite a bit because they were obviously our partner with developing this. Uh, and my first question to him was, did we just take it from another manufacturer, copy and paste? And the answer was clear, absolutely no. Uh, we briefed them two and a half years ago. So it took them two and a half years to develop the system. Over 30,000 man hours and over 100,000 uh, kilometers of endurance testing and, and uh, various tests. Uh, four and a half thousand parameters. So there's a lot that goes into this. And the brief was very clear uh, from us uh, to Bosch. We want a system that reflects our DNA, the ready to race DNA. And where that comes into play is we have two systems or two uh, modes, namely comfort and sport. So we've got those two modes and we have also have five distances to choose from. So let's have a quick look at it and then just talk you through it. So I think the first mode and that's my favorite mode is the sport mode. And basically what it means is it, it's the way that the motorcycle reacts. So if it sees a car, it will reduce speed quite rapidly. Uh, if you want to put the overtake assist on, it will increase the speed quite rapidly. And then the comfort mode, you, you like that, Adrian. Yeah, I like the comfort mode uh, a lot because it's a little bit smoother on the braking, it's a little bit smoother on the acceleration, and if I need to accelerate more, I always can override it with the throttle. I just like the general feel of it, but it's a very personal taste. The distance settings are the same between the two modes, but it's how, how the vehicle reacts to what's happening around it. So let's talk about those distances. So as I said, there's five different ones to choose from. Uh, so the first one being very short. What it does is the system calculates the distance between the motorcycle and the car or the other motorcycle in time. Um, and that way when you start increasing sp the speed, obviously the distance increases. So on very short, your following distance is 0 0.9, which doesn't seem like much, but it, it's sufficient enough to react. Uh, then you go to short, which takes you to one second following distance. You go to middle, which is 1.2 uh, seconds. And then you go to, um, obviously, the next one, which is uh, long, so it's 1.5. And then all the way to very long, which is two seconds. So, uh, I don't know, what does it mean for the rider that doesn't really want to use ACC? Do we have an option for him? Because obviously ACC comes standard on the 1290 Super Adventure S. Uh, so if someone says, I want to buy the bike, but I want to have cruise control and I don't want to use the radar, we have also the option to use the cruise control as a traditional cruise control. The added benefit is because now we use a, a new ABS uh, modulator, and this allows us to use uh, the brakes also for normal cruise control. So if you're riding in a country that has a lot of speed limits or a lot of changing speed limits, for example, and you need to quickly reduce your speed, in the past it would only uh, brake with the engine, so if it's slightly downhill, you might not slow down enough and now the vehicle also applies the brakes, so you can keep using the cruise control even in the, let's say, the traditional cruise control mode. Obviously, we also change the handlebar switches, so the way that you increase or decrease the speed also changes, so really easy to use two paddles uh, with your thumb and your index finger, you can increase and decrease the speed. For us, a really big step forward was the second generation of semi-active suspension. I mean, we've had uh, quite a good run with it and a lot of development in the first generation and the goal for us was to make the semi-active suspension feel like a conventional fork. So with the first generation Super Adventure, we launched the semi-active suspension. Very big step forward in suspension technology. Then came the GT, the second generation of Super Adventure S. And we've worked on developing the semi-active suspension every time. Also during the model years, we've always been fine-tuning it, the software, the hardware, until it got really good. And with this one, we said, okay, let's take everything that we've learned and build it into a new package. And the, one of the key components here is uh, the new valve technology that we use in the fork and the rear shock. These valves are less complex. So in the past we had quite a complicated system. Um, these are less sensitive uh, to production tolerances and they're faster and more accurate. 
I mean, the way that we also measure the movement of the motorcycle has changed, uh, yep. you, obviously using the 60 lean angle sensor. Mm -hmm. yep. What do we use in the past? Yeah, so now we use the 60 lean angle sensor as the central unit to handle all the motion capture of the motorcycle. In the past, we had an accelerometer front and rear that would check what the chassis was doing. Another big benefit for us is you can now adjust the preload while you ride, and that's thanks to the new preload motor. There's a new preload motor. In the past, we had 10 millimeter adjustment. Now we have 20 millimeter adjustment, which is a big change. But the biggest one is, of course, that we could change the, the preload while riding. I mean, something that, again, it's a little bit geeky, but that I liked is, uh, you know, we used to have analog um, displays, and now we've gone digital. And what's, what's the, the difference there? In, you know, we talk analog and digital, that's, that's fine, but what's the benefit for me? So also the, the sensors that we use uh, in the fork and in the rear swing arm, we have a sensor that, that measures what the wheels are doing. And we've gone from analog to digital sensors because, again, they're faster, more accurate, and most of all, they have less, uh, they're less sensitive to interference from outside uh, sources. I said it, it's standard on this motorcycle, and it also has uh, a couple of different modes that you can choose standard. Let's have a look at the standard modes and just identify uh, in which terrain and what kind of speed you should be using. Uh, let's talk about our default mode, street mode first of all. Where would I use this? Yep, street mode is the mode that should fit most riders in most situations. It works from bad roads to uh, good roads. It works from s smooth cruising to porty riding. It's the widest mode and it's basically the, the base setup of the Super Adventure S. So it's pretty much any speed, any road condition. My favorite setting, especially on this island, I mean, there's so many twisty corners, is the sport mode. And it, you can really feel the difference when you go through the modes, uh, stiff and a little bit more damping. Uh, the progression is a lot, a lot stiffer. So what you feel when you ride the bike in sport mode is that the damping is stiffer. Um, but the way the system works, because don't forget it, it's semi-active, so it is always changing the, the damping depending on the movement of the suspension. The main thing you have to remember in sport mode is always grip focused, traction. We try to keep the wheels on the ground at all times. By doing this, we sacrifice comfort a little bit because we allow the, the chassis of the bike to move around more. So you can feel what the wheels are doing and you are always in touch with any irregularities in the road surface. What if you want to be comfortable? If I have my wife on the back and uh, you know, I'm riding on a, on a road surface that's maybe slightly bumpy, I want to keep her happy. How does the comfort mode uh, differentiate the feeling to the rider and the passenger? Comfort mode is basically the exact opposite of sport mode. In comfort mode, we try to keep the vehicle as stable as possible, the vehicle and rider, of course, and we allow the wheels to move around more. The downside of this is, of course, that you are less traction focused, less grip focused, and if you ride, use this for very sporty riding, of course, you're compromising somewhat uh, the grip and traction. But for riding at, you know, still quite nice speeds, it's really good, but it, it's the absolute best when you're just cruising along on bad surfaces in town um, through these little villages with their cobblestones it's it's really good i mean i said we wanted to get the semi-active suspension feel like a conventional uh, system on a conventional rear shock you have the option to turn up or turn down the preload and this is something that we wanted to offer the customer as well so we have a, a preload adjuster which comes standard and you have it in in 10 different steps so from zero to one so the graphic at the back shows you how simple and how easy uh, you, can, you can identify what the motorcycle is doing. And this is again, you can choose. If you want to have the, the back of the motorcycle a bit higher, uh, maybe for sportier turning or, or riding with passenger, or riding luggage. With passenger luggage. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm always thinking sporty because yes, it's an adventure, but I also like getting there quite fast uh, and then enjoying the curves on the way. Uh, or if you're the rider that wants to maybe have your feet closer to the ground and you don't mind sacrificing the geometry of the motorcycle, you can lower it down as well. So this comes standard uh, with the motorcycle. Another feature that is very cool, but it comes as an optional extra, and this is where we start moving into the suspension pro package, is the auto mode. Adrian, how does auto mode help me? So as I mentioned, we have all these sensors that capture the data of what, how the, the vehicle is moving and how the wheels are moving. In auto mode, we use the input from the rider as an additional data point. So if you as a rider are more aggressive on the throttle, you are going at a higher speed, you're braking hard, essentially giving inputs that we have defined as uh, sporty riding, the whole system will firm up the suspension to focus more on this traction type uh, setting. I mean, the best example is I'm riding on a mountain road, you know, I'm really enjoying myself, braking hard, accelerating hard. And then I come down the mountain, I roll into a village, I come off the throttle, 
then the system recognizes this, that my inputs are, are slowing down and the speed goes down, and then the, the, the suspension is automatically changing to a mode much more like our comfort mode. There's n less need for a lot of grip, there's less need for a lot of traction, and it relaxes the suspension a little bit and gives you more comfort. And it continuously switches through all the different settings based on the inputs that you as a rider give. It is an adventure bike, and at some point you're gonna ride on dirt. Uh, and this is why we also offer the off-road mode. And basically what off-road mode means is a little bit softer in the suspension, uh, but more damping at the bottom end of the stroke of the shock and the fork. And we actually said that we're pretty sure if you close someone's eyes and you could do uh, I would say not a blind test because it wouldn't be legal. <laughs> blind test would be a bit tricky. But um, a test where they don't know what the motorcycle is about. They don't know it's got semi-active suspension. I think the feedback would be that it does feel like conventional suspension, even on the off-road. Because obviously with semi-active, there's a lot going on, valves, uh, motors, uh, but it does give you the feedback that you would expect from a, a conventional suspension. Let's talk about something that you really like. Uh, it's the automatic preload adjustment. And just explain to us the different modes and how I would use it out on my journey. So automatic preload adjuster um, is another pretty smart feature. It takes that same preload um, that, we, that you can set with, uh, in 10 clicks, but it measures the, the position of the, of the swing arm. So essentially it's what you do as a rider as well. You put luggage on the bike, uh, you sit on it, uh, your passenger sits on it, and the rear of the bike starts to sit down. So you increase the preload to put the bike back up to that level. We've preset low, standard, and high. And this is of course, if you want to ride high, then the bike stands a little bit more on its nose. It's a little bit more agile. If you set it to low, it's more relaxed geometry. But the really cool thing about it is that it automatically uh, adjust so you if you like the bike to be more agile a little bit more forward uh, oriented you set the preload uh, automatic to high you can ride one up you can ride with a passenger you can put all the luggage on the vehicle automatically corrects and we've had quite some questions about what does preload high mean in the the 10 step settings but that's not how it works because the vehicle increases the preload if you put more load on the bike. As we said, the bike is a really complete package in standard trim, and then we have these optional uh, add-ons that you can add on. Something I really liked personally was the advanced mode, and that gives me quite a lot of possibilities in terms of setting up. Um, so, I mean, let's go through it and just see what these possibilities are. Uh, so, obviously, we've spoken about the preload adjuster already. Then we have an anti-dive function, and initially I battled to grasp uh, the benefit out of having this. And I started thinking back uh, of some adventure tours that I did with my wife. And I can't tell you how many times when I break for a corner, I have her helmet hitting me on the back of my helmet. Uh, and then we have an argument and we carry on riding. So when I started thinking this and reminiscing of some of the, the tours that we did, I thought, okay, this does make sense. I activate anti-dive. Yes, when I break, it does still add uh, or shift weight to the front, but maybe not as much as what it normally would do. And that would definitely prevent uh, my wife from hitting me on the back of the head, not just with the helmet, but also with the hand. So, you know, it's a win-win for me. So definitely see, the, see the, uh, the benefit out of having this. And yeah, on the, on the, on the press launch, um, you know, we've had good feedback about it. Actually, some guys actually said they prefer riding with it because they don't like the motorcycle shifting as much weight forward. So we suggest that you try it. It's a, it go? Yeah, it's a very personal thing. I mean, yeah. um, it illustrates that we allow everyone to just fine tune the bike however it fits their personal situation. I mean, the other, other possibility that you have in this advanced mode is that you can individually set the front forks uh, and the rear shock in different stages, uh, and that's, that's for damping, right? Yes, it's the, it's the damping of the fork and the damping of the shock that you can set individually. It's not like a traditional clicking system. This, the system is still semi-active, so it will still react to the road surface, but it could be that you say, now I want to have a little bit more damping on the front, I want to have a little bit less damping on the rear, for example, you can play around and set your own suspension settings. I mean, that's something that I really liked, and you know, I like playing around with these things and, and feeling the difference and, and you know, just setting the bike up like I wanted. Adrian, something that, a question that popped up quite a bit, when I use my ride modes, does it affect the suspension? No. Why not? Because you ride in sport, I ride in street, but we both ride with the bike in uh, sport suspension mode. So I can choose, I can set the bike up to, for example, if I want to ride an off-road uh, throttle mode, but still want to have quite firm suspension, I can do that. 
So we've, we've kept it separate, so you're much more free to choose how you set up the bike. I mean, Adrian, I mentioned that uh, this is the next generation of adventure bike for us, you know, something that we're really proud of. Um, the guys did an amazing job on it. Uh, you know, you don't have to spend too much time on it to see that there's a massive difference in terms of outgoing model and our new model. Uh, but, you know, the components have filtered down from the old model, um, but we didn't just take them and, and use them. Uh, we looked at every single part, as I said. Uh, we mentioned the front headlight. What changed on the front headlight except for, for the big radar on the front? We wanted to keep the iconic look of the, of the front headlight because you know, when you see uh, one of these big 1290s uh, on the street, it's immediately recognizable as a KTM. Uh, so this was, this was a given, we had to, had to keep this, this design uh, form. The headlight is probably one of the best on the market. Uh, we've done quite a lot of testing also with competitor models, but we decided that we wanted to have more light output and also a little bit wider so that you have got more light to the sides of the road. Yeah, and just before you start using the, the cornering lights with the wider beam pattern, it's much easier to turn into the corners. I mean, Adrian, we obviously do a lot of testing and simulations and things like that. To a certain point, you can test these lights in, on a computer and in a controlled environment. How do we test them in Matikov now? There's a full team uh, taking care of lights. Of course, it's, it's a very important part of, of a motorcycle. And a lot of the testing and development gets done in our in-house laboratory where we can measure the light output. The problem is that a rider is not a computer, so a measured light output doesn't always translate well into usable light output. So behind the factory, we have an officially certified the darkest road of Europe. You leave the factory and it's like two kilometers from there. You go into the, the super dark forest. There are no houses, there are no street lights, and we have uh, three hairpins and it's quite steep and it's always wet and slippery and it's got a, a, a barrier on the side. And this is where we develop our headlights. We've done a lot of testing also with competitor models and I can tell you it's sometimes very scary to ride some of these other bikes. And I'm really proud of to say that what we have is really an amazing light output. So to sum it up, uh, new LED headlights, keeping that iconic uh, look, uh, increased beam pattern, obviously for night riding, but also for daytime riding. Uh, we obviously have LED indicators as well as uh, LED brake light. As an option, we add uh, adaptive brake on the back or adaptive brake light. And that's also something that filtered down from, from the Super Duke. H how does that work? Again, you know, using the sensors of the bike, if the bike decelerates very rapidly, the rear tail light starts to flash. So when you're following your buddy, you see the light flashing, you know there's that, that was the oops moment. Um, Cause it's, yeah, but it, it's really helpful because especially when you're riding in a group, uh, when you see the guy in front of you, if the, if the light starts to flash, you know that you have to really start braking. I think the important question here is uh, the V-twin engine. Uh, you know, some of the competitors came out with different configurations. Uh, we've had this platform for, for quite a long time. Uh, is it still relevant? Yeah, I'm a firm believer that uh, a V-twin engine is the absolute best engine you can have in an adventure bike. It's a super narrow build, it's extremely torquey, and it still has 160 horsepower, which is more than enough than you need on an adventure bike. I mean, let's be honest, when you're riding adventure bike, yes, you know, when you're on a beautiful island like this and you have nice twisty turns, you know, you get on the gas, that's where the torque comes into play. You know, long straights, you have the 160 horsepower and the speed limit is only 90 kilometers an hour. So you're really fast at 90 kilometers an hour. And then you slow down, yeah. Um, but it also makes it more accessible. So if you're riding along with alone or with your wife on the back and you need to overtake a car, you can be in pretty much any gear and just roll on. The torque will drive you past uh, where with some other configurations of engines you need to be in the optimal gear, optimum RPM just to get past. So it just makes it a little bit more relaxing and it really fits into the spirit of adventure bike riding. We've obviously done some work to the engine. Again, learnings from Super Duke now filtered into this adventure model. We saved quite a bit of weight. Uh, in total, 1.6 kilograms saved on the engine. A lot of focus on the casings. Inside an engine, of course, you have to circulate oil. And um, in one part of the engine, there was uh, an oil channel inside an aluminum part of the case. And when our engineers had another look, they realized that they did not need all this aluminum because the, the strength of that part was not was, was, was good enough. So it could be reduced to the absolute minimum. And now the oil flows through a super thin aluminum tube, which weighs almost nothing. So they could just take a whole bunch of aluminum out because it was not needed. I mean, we also decreased the tolerances on the piston rings and uh, cylinders. This has obviously helped us optimize the mapping of the engine, but there's also a benefit for the customer.
the tolerances on the on the piston and the bore of the cylinder are now smaller it basically uh, increases the reliability but essentially this engine is bulletproof these engines run forever the first thing that i noticed when i got on the motorcycle was how smooth the gearbox was and that was a big uh, goal for us is to make the shifting a lot smoother and a lot of work was done on the gearbox uh, not just uh, with software in terms of the quick shifter plus which has been updated but also on the hardware we changed a lot inside we changed the shift drum uh, which used to be made from steel now made from aluminium so again saving quite a bit of weight there uh, we also changed some of the coatings that we normally use um, on the shift uh, or the selector shift um, we used to use hard uh, chrome now we use bronze uh, and copper making it a lot smoother uh, we've also changed the length of the shift lever travel arm uh, and put a lighter spring in as well. So this all just making the gearbox a lot smoother. Uh, and as I said, also updating the quick shifter plus settings, which make that uh, nice smooth shifting uh, if you're using ACC or not ACC. With that, we also changed the airbox, which is also an important step for us. Uh, we changed the header exhaust pipes. Uh, we added Lambda sensors. Obviously now Euro 5. I mean, we mentioned weight saving. That was a big goal for us. Because when you introduce Euro 5, you're obviously adding more hardware, more cats, more, yeah, a lot, a lot of things you're adding. We also added more technology, obviously with the ACC. So that was a big goal for us. Focus on every single part, reduce it where we can, obviously keeping it uh, within keep the, the weight under control. Yeah. yeah, keep it under control. And yeah, as we said, results really good. It is still a fairly big adventure bike, um, but as I said, it's perfectly balanced. Uh, when you ride the motorcycle and you have to turn really uh, tight turns at, at slow speed, you'll feel that the bike, yeah, it's, it feels like a, a big trout bike. The surprising thing every time I get on it is that when you ride it, you don't even realize how big it is. I've seen people that really were a little bit nervous getting on this big adventure and they came off and like, it's unbelievable. It, it's so easy to handle and so easy to ride. I mean, we already spoke about the radiator, so that was quite clear. Uh, focused radiator per cylinder, and it makes a massive difference. We now have uh, obviously new cooling and new oiling systems as well, which also help uh, with that. And something I noticed straight away when I rode the bike is, as I said, I always look at numbers, uh, and you look at the, the oil temperature and the water temperature, and on various degrees, I mean, we rode the motorcycle in really cold weather, really hot weather, and it stays really consistent. And I think that's what, what adds here, you know, getting the heat away from the engine, getting the heat away from from the rider and also just keeping that consistency on that long trip so really good work there from the team we spoke about the tank it's now a three cell low displacement of weight adding to that perfect weight distribution it is an adventure bike so just depending on what you use the bike for or where you live you'll probably end up doing really long adventures uh, maybe with some dust roads or dirt roads as well uh, and on these long trips you obviously want to stop and have a look at the air filter make sure it's clean on the previous model it was quite difficult to get to the air filter now really easy on the top we've added this little uh, storage, storage box. box there we go thank you it's got place for a usb uh, as well as for a phone and by simply removing four bolts uh, you take the air filter out so it's vertically placed it's a cartridge system pull it out, clean it off, and off you go. And because it's vertical as well, all the dust particles that actually sit on the filter fall off quite easy, so really good there. High snorkels, so if you do go through water, obviously you can go pretty deep before the water goes into the airbox. And then being so high, it's forcing a bit of a ram air effect that you get into, into the airbox. Big benefit of the easy access to the air filter is of course that for like a, a vehicle service at the dealer, it also reduces the service times. We've had race on for quite a while now. Race on is a system, super cool. You've got your key, you put it in your pocket. You obviously can switch on the ignition. You can start the motorcycle. You can open the fuel cap without using a key. Uh, we've added two features to race on now. The first one's called ARA, so anti-relay attack. What does that do? A relay attack is basically where someone picks up the signal from your key, copies it and uses it later to steal your motorcycle. It doesn't happen very much, but it's technically possible. So we worked on uh, a system where you push a button on the key, put the key in your pocket, put your helmet on, your gloves, and then you can start the bike and ride off. So you have about 10 minutes uh, between pushing start and, and taking off. You can also switch this functionality off. I live in a, in a very small rural village in Austria, so for me, the risk of a motorcycle being stolen is not so very big, so I would switch it off. 
but being living in, in like a larger city as where I used to live, I would definitely have the system on. And we're also noticing that some insurance companies are now asking for these kinds of systems on motorcycles, so it might help you to reduce the cost of your insurance. That was the one feature that we added. The second feature is you no longer need a key to take the seat off. So by just pressing a button, the passenger seat pops off. You can get to your, your storage little compartment. You can adjust your front seat. Um, so really easy, no more use for a key. And the key actually looks pretty cool as well. Adrian, we spoke about these software packages. The motorcycle is a, a complete package. If you want to fine tune things, this is where you add the packages. We have an, a strategy in, with these packages. Essentially what we do is we build a motorcycle that you do not need to buy any of our software but everything that uh, we have, you can buy separate. So if you want to buy only a quick shifter, it's possible. If you want to buy only the rally mode, you can buy it. Then we combine everything in what we call the tech pack, which we then offer at a reduced price uh, compared to if you would purchase all the components separately. And this, I think, makes it really easy to get all the, the different software options in one go. I believe that all the options that we have really add a lot of value to the bike, but we want to give the freedom to the rider to choose whether or not they want to have these options. I mean, obviously, our main focus is motorcycles, uh, but another big part of our business is power parts. When you think about adventuring, depending on what you want to do, where you want to go, we have a variety of different selections. I mean, three of my favorite ones is definitely the tank bag. For me personally, when I cross borders, I want to have my passport, my wallet, my phone, um, you know, maybe some money really close by, free up some space in the pockets. Obviously, very important is the the touring cases, you need to put your luggage somewhere uh, with a new floating system. A lot of work's actually gone into that, and at various speeds, the motorcycle stays very stable. Uh, and then obviously, a cup of which slip on, you know, because you need that extra sound. It sounds amazing. Another part of the business is obviously clothing, and we've spent quite a lot of time in absolutely pouring rain. So we were very thankful we had some decent gear on. We've partnered up with various partners to, to make sure that we get the best quality uh, and the best fit as well. So we basically have two dedicated uh, gear sets for this motorcycle. Uh, the one on the left more focused on road riding uh, and the one on the right uh, more focused on off-road riding. Both of them are amazing, both of them are waterproof, you know, Gore-Tex, awesome lining, winter lining inside which is removable so you have one set of gear for summer and winter. Really good gear, it kept us dry the entire time and uh, it does look pretty cool as well. Just to recap what the all new KTM 1290 Super Adventure is all about. This motorcycle feels fast. It has ready-to-race technology and, of course, it has all the gear. 